Welcome back, Chappelle. All right, welcome back to a Saturday at my house. As you can see, this definitely isn't my classroom. Uh, no, but I tried to actually record y'all's flip for the weekend. Uh, well, CD period. You have it over the weekend. Gee, I haven't even seen y'all yet. Looking forward to it. Um, but the big thing about it is... Uh, I tried to record this flip. It ended up being 29 minutes long. It was hot garbage. It was so bad, but whatever. It happens to the best of us sometimes. So what we're going to do is we're going to pick up right where we left off in class, and we're talking about ancient Egypt, right? So we spent most of class talking about, of course, Mesopotamia, right? So in Mesopotamia, of course, as we remember, it's located right around here in the modern-day country of Iraq, right? And then we jumped over to a parallel kingdom that was growing right over here. That's where ancient Egypt is, right? So big things to remember when you're comparing the two of these things together, maybe go back in your notes and find this, jot it down, underline it, or whatever, is that the key difference between them is that Mesopotamia had a ton of different city-states that all operated independently, right? They had places like Sumer, Ur, Babylon, um, and many, many other city-states that actually had their own governments and their own kings and their own leaders and their own people and all these other things. Whereas Egypt was a one centralized kingdom that was being ruled off of the Nile River. Now, to give you an understanding of what centralized means, a lot of it kind of plays exactly where we left off when we were talking about their government, right? So the Egyptian government is centralized in the sense of that they are ruled by one person from one location in one, like, capital city, right? So, for example, Louisiana has a centralized government. It has Baton Rouge. It has the governor. It has all of these different figures, yes, but it's a centralized rulership. The United States of America is a centralized rulership from Washington, D.C., right? So, as you can see... Egypt, very different. Made their culture ubiquitous. It went from the top of their kingdom all the way to the bottom. Egyptians had Egyptian culture, did the same Egyptian things, and had a lot of people living in this one kingdom, right? And like we said earlier, they were all ruled over by this person, right? Called their pharaoh, which is going to actually indicate their theocratic government. Now, a lot of Mesopotamian city-states, not all of them, but a lot of them did also have this theocratic government. You've seen words that look a lot like theocracy in the past, right? You've seen theology with Mr. Mathern. You've seen, like, you've heard of theologians before with Mr. Madrano, right? Theocracy, the T-H-E-O, indicates religion. That's what that word means, right? And C-R-A-C-Y is just a system of rulership, right? So that means that their religion and their government are actually bound together. They thought that their pharaoh was an extension of their chief god, Amun-Ra. Now also, just to give you a heads up, they're also polytheistic, which we'll get to here in a second. But he was a chief part of their, like, religious structure, and they believed that he was an extension of God himself, right? So a theocracy is an important thing. You should probably definitely underline that or, like, highlight it or something like that. Now, another big part of their government system, though, was the idea that... Where are you? They had a bureaucratic system, right? So a bureaucracy is a multi-leveled government. So I'm showing it to you right here on this little thing. It looks, ironically, a lot like a pyramid, which I know is like very convenient for me in the long run, but it is what it is. Now, the pharaoh would be up here at the very, very top of their government. Now, the way the bureaucratic system works and the reason why they had to have it is because Egypt was so large, right? Since it was so large and was being ruled from one place by one person, they needed a structure of government that had many different levels and ranks to it to make it so the pharaoh could just say something or decree something or want to raise taxes or want to do this or want to go to war. How was he supposed to carry that message to thousands of people? Well, he would report to his viziers. He has viziers, the guys that worked underneath him, right? These, there is actually two of them, one for Upper Egypt and one for Lower Egypt. And they would carry these messages out to the overseers, who would tell the governors, who would tell the scribes, who would tell... The, and you see what I'm talking about? It's a multi-leveled government, and it works a lot like our school does, right? Our school, you could say, has a bureaucratic system, starting with Miss Dantagnan, then going to our assistant principals, then to the teachers, and then to y'all. So that is a big part of the ancient Egyptian kind of gift to society and civilization. It's this concept of how to rule over a very large kingdom with tons of people when you only have a centralized leadership, right? Another big thing about ancient Egypt, though, also is the higher status of women, right? So there are actually female leaders in Egypt. These two right here are two of the most famous queens that have ever existed in ancient Egypt. This is Nefertiti, which is King Tut's stepmom, and then that right there is the last queen of Egypt, Cleopatra, right? So they actually had more of a reverence for female leadership and things like that 
very, very different from many of the other ancient civilizations we'll talk about. Now, another big gift that they had is they also had their writing system as well. The uh, Mesopotamians had cuneiform. Their writing system was very intricate and like looked all like those goofy little wedge shapes and stuff like that. This is different. Hieroglyphics are pictograms, right? So what a pictogram means is literally writing with a picture, right? So this is what hieroglyphics look like. Every single image or picture means either one of two different things. It either represents a character and sound in their alphabet or it represents a syllable in their alphabet, right? So by using this type of writing, which was very complex, very hard to teach and very hard to learn, they were able to do something just like the Mesopotamians were, which was actually to intricately document agricultural yields, taxation, and many other different things for their centralized kingdom. But this is what their writing looked like. And I think it was Sarah in D period that said, wait a minute, Mr. Terry, I thought that like they had a writing system called hieroglyphics. She was just like, we were talking about Mesopotamia, but she was right on the money. She knew exactly what we were talking about in the long run. This is exactly what you were thinking about, Sarah. So very good job. Very, very smart of you to actually know that already. Very impressed. Now they also though, to create, some of y'all just saw that like those hieroglyphics were actually chiseled into a wall. That wasn't always the case. The Egyptians were also the very first people to come up with a simple style of paper. This stuff right here is called papyrus. It's made out of reeds that grew along the banks of the Nile River, and they would be able to harvest those things, turn them into a pulp, and then put them under sheets, and they actually made paper out of it. And they were able to record religious ceremonies, uh, different events, calendar events, anything they needed to on a simple type of paper. It was really, really interesting. This right here is actually a page or a piece of script from their Book of the Dead. This is actually what they believed happened to you when you died, right? And so it was like a Bible passage to them, in a sense, on this piece of papyrus paper. It actually shows right here their god Anubis, one of them anyway, who is uh, like the scavenger of the dead, and he's bringing you into the underworld. Your heart is being weighed on this little thing right here, and then you're being brought through the system to their god of the underworld, Osiris, right? And like I said, this was all inside of a book on pieces of paper, right? And you can actually see the hieroglyphics in the background as well. Now, their religion, like we just indicated two seconds ago, because it said Anubis, the god of the underworld. There's Toth on there, who's the god of scribes and writing. There's, uh, what you call it, um, Osiris, who's the god of... Uh, like, um, wait, no, judgment and like the afterlife. So they obviously are polytheistic, just like the Mesopotamians were, right? They had a very intricate belief in the afterlife and that relates directly to a very big process that Egyptians were known for that we still kind of use all the time in a way. Like we, we don't mummify people, but they mummify people and we've adopted it for an embalming system. But this right here, that is the most famous leader of ancient Egypt, that is King Tut himself. That is what King Tut looks like now. So he's over 3,000 years old, but the thing about it is that's crazy, is if he's 3,000 years old, shouldn't he just be like dirt? Shouldn't he be completely decomposed and just be like ethereally like gone someplace else or like maybe one of his atoms is in my hand or something right now, who knows? But he's not. And the reason why is because the Egyptians adopted a system known as mummification where they would actually preserve bodies of the dead in a very intricate process that involves cutting the body open, removing all of the organs, placing certain ones in jars that would actually go with the body into the afterlife, because they believe that if like you got embalmed without your inner workings, then you wouldn't be able to imbibe in their heaven, which was this place called like the happy field of food where they thought they were just eating all the time. Uh, so they actually gave you your stomach, your lungs, your liver, your intestines, and I think one other one that I can never remember. I think it's your kidneys. They all went into jars that actually were buried with you so you could take them with you to the afterlife. They would remove your heart because they thought that that wasn't necessary for you to take. They would also remove your brain by sticking a red hot poker up there and swirling it around and ripping it all out. But you were, of course, dead during this time period. But then they would stuff the body with salts and herbs and stuff, dry you out, wrap you in linen, stick you in the dirt, right? Now, the most fake... Oh, whoa, that's what... Can we think King Tut actually looked like. Now, the one of the most famous places where they actually buried several of these mummified bodies, of course, are in the Great Pyramids of Giza. The Great Pyramids of Giza were actually, I believe, originally in, uh, designed and built under the Pharaoh Khufu, is what his name was, K-H-U-F-O, or wait, K-H-U-F-U, -U. and literally these Great Pyramids were meant to house <clears throat> the pharaohs of ancient Egypt after they had died. And this is what I was talking about earlier. These are some of those cops and stuff on camels and uh, on the backs of horses. Now, the big thing, though, 
Egypt is a very intricate place, very intense place, very important when it comes to the study of ancient um, civilizations. But then we have like about four of them we're going to move through pretty fast, okay? So the next one we're talking about, we're actually jumping back over to Mesopotamia. So we were talking about all these places, right? So Egypt was kicking butt and growing a lot. Mesopotamia had Sumer and a couple other ones. Well, all of a sudden, right about there, another city-state popped up in Mesopotamia, and over several hundred years, they began to grow very, very strong. So we're going back over to Mesopotamia to talk about this little guy, and that is the city-state of Babylon, right? You've heard of Babylon before in the Old Testament, okay? Babylon actually went through two phases, the Babylonian Empire and the Neo-Babylonian Empire, but the big thing about them is that they were had a very, very intense leadership under one king, and they benefited from the spread of technology from Sumeria, right? So the Sumerian tech, like writing, uh, the invention of like cultivated agriculture, uh, different like ideas that spread from that city-state, eventually spread to the Babylonians. And the really intense thing that happened under the Babylonian Empire is they were then coalesced together by a very intense king, right? And his name was King Hammurabi. And this is what we believe, uh, we may or may not believe he looked like. They also had a theocratic government. So this is also a very, very common image you saw in Mesopotamian architecture and art. Uh, recessed carvings into buildings to demonstrate the power of the king who looked a lot like basically one of their gods. But the big thing about it is King Hammurabi not only used the technology from Sumeria, but he created a very organized military, right? So the big thing about it, though, with this military, all right, he used it to conquer the entire Fertile Crescent area, right? He took over Sumer, Acadia, uh, Ur, and many, many other city-states, right? And in the process of taking all these places over and bringing them into his empire, this Babylonian empire, he decided to go out there and use a different system of rulership, right? He didn't want to use the bureaucratic system that the Egyptians used. He wanted to use a code of law. So he developed the very first multi-structured, multi-level like level code of law known as Hammurabi's Code because it is the code designed by Hammurabi. And what it is based off of is this concept of an eye for an eye. Now I'm going to give you a very simple description of this and we're going to go much more in depth with it when we get into class. An eye for an eye is basically the concept of like, let's say hypothetically, that Carmen jumped up in class, ran to the back of the room, and just slapped Lala in the face, right? So just like slaps her in the face. Well, according to Hammurabi's code, if we were still following this, Lala is entitled to slap her back, right? It's an even retribution of law. It's supposed to be based on this eye for an eye concept. But the problem with the eye for an eye concept is it's not always that fair, right? So it seems very, very, in a nutshell, pretty even because it's like, what you do to me, I do back unto you. But the problem is, as much like the Bible has told us, is apparently like an eye for an eye will leave the whole world blind. It's not completely fair, right? Because it was especially not fair between people of different ranks. For example, under Hammurabi's code, if a son hit his father, the son's hand would be cut off, right? Or, for example, if women did similar crimes to men, women could be put to death, right? So whereas men would just have the punishment done back onto them. And the biggest place where it was unfair was the fact that if you were wealthy, you didn't have to receive the punishment back into you. You could just pay it off, right? Like, let's say hypothetically, Mr. Mathern is super rich. I am somebody who is a laborer. I'm painting his house. I drop my paint bucket. It hits Mr. Mathern in the face, right? He now gets to hit me in the face with a paint bucket, theoretically, and you understand what I'm saying. But, like, the thing about it is, is if it were the other way around, if Mr. Mathern hurt me, a poor person, then he can just pay me. See, that's not fair because, like, that is a part of our econo like the economic inequality problems that we had talked about following the Neolithic Revolution. Now, the last things we're going to talk about, we have two more kingdoms to talk about. We're going to leave these guys for the very, very end. But the other small kingdoms, right? So we had three other small groups of people that popped up during this time period and began to kind of spread all over these different areas, right? Now, getting into it, though, in the long run, you are going to have a quiz on these six different civilizations. So we had Sumer or Mesopotamia early, and then we had Egypt, then we had Babylon. We're going to have the Hebrews, the Phoenicians, and the Assyrians. Now, the Assyrians we're going to talk about in class, right? Mainly because they're really, really intense, and the things that they gave, I need to be able to explain in a little bit of a different way. But the Hebrews are really, really important because you know them by a different name now. They are now known as the modern-day Jews, right? So the Hebrews actually started out 
as an ancient culture and people, and they were founded in the modern-day Israel era. So let's jump back to our map real quick, and we're going to zoom out, and then we're going to trash that, and we're going to zoom back in. To give you an understanding of where Canaan is, it's right there, right? That's Israel, Jordan, Palestine area today. And the big thing about it is right there. I'm going to go back to it real quick again so you can see. There's Egypt. There's like Mesopotamia, Tigris, and the Euphrates would have been right there. And then the Hebrews would have founded their kingdom right there in a place called Canaan, right? So the big thing about it, since they actually founded in this place called Canaan, they're also known as the Canaanites, right? Their origin is in that area, and they are the very big, big contributors or something major, major, major to ancient civilization's history in general Western Civ. The fact that they created the first monotheistic religion, right? That is the big difference between the Hebrews and the rest of the communities that existed during this time period. Around 1500 BC, when they established themselves as a kingdom, they created the faith of Judaism, right? And they became the race of people known as the Jews, right? And so their big, big, big difference was the fact that they had a system that had one God in it, just one, not this pantheon of polytheistic people. They believed in God the Father, which is also connected to Catholicism, as you know, and so, like, in our in the Holy Trinity of Catholicism, right, you have the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Their belief is just in the Father, right? And they believe they called him Yahweh, right? Yahweh is spelled Y-A-H-W-E-H, -E right? And they wrote all of this stuff down in their holy book known as the Tanakh, right? Now, the Tanakh is their actual holy book. Some of you are like, wait a minute, Mr. Terry, I've been to a bar mitzvah. I heard it was the Torah, right? The Torah is actually only one-third of their holy book. It's one section of it, and it's mostly like encompasses daily life practices and also the origin of the world and stuff like that. For example, the first five books of the Old Testament come directly from the Torah. It's why Christians sometimes believe that that is their one and only holy book when it actually isn't, right? The Tanakh is the entire thing put together. Now, the Torah, though, includes the five major books of the Old Testament, uh, Genesis, Numbers, Leviticus, Deuteronomy, and Exodus, right? So, that's really important that you know, and it's also very important something else that you know about the Hebrews is that they're a very small culture, but they're going to begin this process known as a diaspora. Because some of you are all like, well, wait a minute, Mr. Terry, I studied World War II when I was in middle school, and my teacher told me that there were a ton of Jewish people in Europe during the 1940s. How did they get from Israel all the way over there? Well, the thing about it is, is because of their culture and because of their governance style and also because of their very intense monotheistic faith, they were a small structure that or a small culture that got taken over by a lot of different people. The Babylonians took them over at one point. The Neo Babylonians took them over at one point. The Persians took them over. The Assyrians took them over. And they did not look kindly upon the fact that the Jews did not believe in their polytheistic religious structure and they refused to accept it. So in that process, it actually led to a burning of their cities in this thing known as a diaspora. And the diaspora means that they spread out, right? So the Jewish people began to literally try to find any safety anywhere they could get. So they began to spread all over different parts of the world, right? So due to the fact that it's 18 minutes right now into this flip, I'm going to go ahead and cut it off here. We're going to talk about the last two cultures in class. We're going to talk about the Phoenicians and the, what you call it, the Phoenicians and the Assyrians in class. We have a lot of stuff to go over when we get into class. We'll talk about your quiz when it's coming up the following class period. But I'll see you guys then. Y'all have a great rest of your weekend. Y'all have a good one.